Hey everyone, welcome back to trigonometry. This will be lecture seven of the course. And in this section, we're going to get into the inverse trigonometric functions. So let's go ahead and jump into it. And we'll call this section 2.3 uh, inverse trigonometric functions. Okay, so let's, uh, let's start by recalling what uh, an inverse function is. Okay, so let's recall a couple of things. First, a function that is one to one has an inverse function. Okay, so a function that is one to one has an inverse function, right? And secondly, kind of the way to think about it is that if AB, right, if AB is on the graph of F, right, the function F, uh, then the point, what will we do? We'll flip it, won't we? BA is on the graph of the inverse. Okay. Okay, so those are kind of the two things to recall. So we need one-to-oneness in order for an inverse to exist. Um, and it, if an inverse does exist, then if AB is on the graph of the function, the original function, then you can flip the coordinates uh, to uh, identify a, a comparable point on the graph of the inverse function. Okay, so let's start by talking about the sine function now that we've seen what it looks like. Um, let's consider the sine function. And we're going to graph it here quick. Let's get a picture of this thing. And we, we, we know what it looks like, right? We know I'm going to graph a bunch of points here. Okay, and so we'll just kind of go out three, 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 three. Okay. All right, so the graph of the sine function starts here, and then it goes up. All right, and it kind of does one of these. Right, and similarly over here, it's going to go the opposite direction. All right, so it's going to kind of go like this. Okay. Now, <clears throat> is the uh, is the sine function a one-to-one -one function? No. Right. The sine function is definitely not one-to-one. -one, right. So the sine function is not a one-to-one -one function. Right, and you can see that if you think about it. So this is maybe one, let's just plot one half. So this is one half, right? So let's see, we got a one half is here. We got a, kind of make them in big. We got a one half there. We're gonna have another one right here. We got another one there, right? Oh, another one here, right? So these are all y equals one half. All right, so there's lots of values of x that map to y equals one half. There are, for example, many values of x where y equals one half. Okay, so you can see that that's just a, a very clear and obvious counterexample, right? So the sine function taken as a whole is not a one-to-one -one function. Um, but what we're going to do is we're still going to define a, an inverse sine function, uh, hence the name of the section, inverse trig function. We're going to define an inverse sine function, but we're going to do it on a uh, what, what we kind of can call a restricted sine function. So let's consider a restricted sine function. Okay, and so specifically, we're gonna let we're gonna define sine uh, as being just between negative pi over two and pi over two. Okay, I said less than or equal to. Okay, and on, so on this region, the sine function is one to one. All right, so let's see what that looks like. Okay, we'll say that's one, and then we'll say that's negative one, and we'll say this is negative pi over two, and then 
2, 3, 4, we'll say this is positive pi over 2. Okay, so we know what the sine function looks like here. It kind of goes like this, doesn't it? All right, so this is just y equals sine of x, but restricted to just the region from negative pi over 2 up to pi over 2, pi over 2. Okay, and so on this restricted domain, sine is 1 to 1, and so therefore we can talk about an inverse of the sine function. So on this restricted domain, we can talk about an inverse sine function. Okay, so this is how we're going to get around it. Right? And this is all going to work out nicely. You may be thinking this is very messy. Why? What about the rest of the sine function? Well, if you recall, the sine function is periodic. right? So it's going to repeat itself a fair amount. And so it's going to turn out that this piece right here is all we're really going to need to have uh, a very effective inverse sine function. OK, let's talk about some notation here. Let's talk about some notation here, and we'll get into some examples and start to think this through a little bit more. So notation, right? There's a couple of ways to notate the sine, the inverse sine function. Probably the most common is this, like this, right? And so this is basically you've got sine with an inverse. This is the typical sort of inverse symbol that you'll you'll find in in math, right? And it's very important not to confuse this with like if I have like this, right? X to the negative one, we know that equals one over X. This is not equal to one over sine of X, right? And so this is purely notation. Okay, so it's almost like just a different name. Instead of the, the name sine, S-I-N, we are putting, we're writing inverse sine in this in this manner this notation does not extend to this reciprocal concept so this is kind of the most this is probably the most common way you'll see it you'll most commonly it'll be inverse sine of x like that right another way you'll see it though is you'll see it called the arc sine so inverse sine is also known as Uh, arc sine. Okay, so sometimes you'll see it written like this, and these two are equivalent. Those two ways of expressing the inverse sine function are equivalent. Okay. Okay, so that's the notation. Let's go ahead and define the inverse sine uh, formally here, and then we'll do some examples. See how this is useful. Okay, so the inverse sine function, right, the inverse sine function denoted by okay, is the inverse of the restricted sine function. Uh, y equals sine of x. Okay, and it's restricted specifically on negative pi over 2 up to pi over 2. So that range that we just described. Okay, and so it's important to remember what this means. Right? What does this mean? Y equals the inverse sine of x means uh, the sine of y equals x where negative pi over 2 is less than or equal to y which is less than or equal to pi over 2 and of course x is since it's a sine function x is going to be between negative 1 and 1 okay okay so that's the idea that's the idea
right? The inverse sine function denoted by sine inverse x is the inverse of the restricted sine function y equals sine of x on this interval from negative pi over two to pi over two. Y equals the inverse sine of x means sine of y equals x, where y is an angle in this range and one is a real number in this range. Okay. <clears throat> Right, so it's very important that you, the, kind of the key to understanding inverse functions, uh, well, inverse trig functions in particular, is to note that when I say y equals the inverse sine of x, right, this is the angle, okay, that's the angle, pi over 2, 3 pi over 4, whatever it happens to be, that's the angle, and this is a real number. Right, the angle's a real number too, but this is sort of like the answer you would get after you plug in, uh, well, I'll say it's a real number between uh, negative one and one. Okay, so with the inverse function, I plug in a value between negative one and one, and what I get out is the angle that produces that value under the sine function. Right, that's what this is saying up here. Right, y equals the inverse sine of x means that sine of y, sine of this angle, equals this number between zero, between negative one and one. Okay. Okay, let's do some examples. Let's talk through a few examples here and see what's going on here. I guess before we talk through examples, let's kind of flesh out a general approach to to using the inverse sine function. So we'll say how to identify exact values of the inverse sine function. All right, I'm going to say that there's three steps here. The first step is we're going to write this explicitly. We're going to write, we're going to let theta equal the inverse sine of x, right? And by using this notation with theta, it helps to guarantee that you'll think of this as an angle. The answer here is an angle, right? So the reverse of what you normally would think of as the answer for a sine function. Okay, and then we're going to rewrite. Step two is to rewrite theta equals the inverse sine of x as sine of theta equals x, where x is between well, we'll just write it like that, okay? So we're gonna rewrite, so we start by writing this explicitly using this angle notation, and then we know that theta equals inverse sine of x means that sine of theta is equal to x, okay? And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna look up the value, okay? We're gonna look up the value of theta as needed. And what all I mean by that is we're gonna reference the uh, uh, the trig cheat sheet, the unicircle cheat sheet that we've looked at uh, in previous sections. Okay, let's do an example here. Okay, let's take a look at the example. So let's find the exact value of the inverse sine of square root of 2 over 2. Okay, so step one, theta equals the inverse sine of the square root of two over two. Okay, step two, we're gonna take this thing and we could say theta equals the inverse sine of square root of two over two. That implies that the sine of the angle theta, whatever it happens to be, needs to equal the square root of two over two. Okay, and then what's step three? Well, we're going to look at the unit circle. Okay, so let's take a look. I've got the unit circle here. Let's blow this up a little bit more. Okay, so uh, remember when we're looking at the unit circle here, uh, cosine is the first coordinate in the ordered pair, sine is the second. So I'm looking, remember I'm always looking when we're talking about the inverse sine function, we're restricted to just this section over here between negative pi over two and pi over two. So I'm looking for a value of theta where the sine is square root of two over two. And you can see I've got one right here, don't I? Uh, 
pi over 4. Okay, so when theta is pi over 4, then sine of theta is square root of 2 over 2. Okay, so looking at the unit circle, and specifically between negative pi over 2 uh, and we can see that when theta is pi over 4 sine of theta is square root of 2 over 2 okay and so the answer is pi over 4 So the answer is theta equals pi over 4. All right, that's what we're looking for. We want to know which angle produces square root of 2 over 2. So the inverse sine of square root of 2 over 2 is pi over 4. Okay, that's the idea. All right, okay. All right, so that's the idea of the inverse sine function, and here's how we can use it, and here's an example of us using it. What about the cosine function? What about the inverse cosine function? Well, this is going to be similarly defined. Okay, so. With the inverse sine function, we were limited the, the domain uh, of, the, of the sine function. We're going to do the same thing with the cosine function. Right, the cosine function we're going to restrict uh, to between 0 and pi. Okay, so this would be like pi over 2, and this would be like pi. And so what does the cosine function do? Well, it starts at 1, if you remember, and then it goes down to 0 at pi over 2 and then it's at negative 1 when it hits pi, so it kind of looks like this. Okay. Now notice, I mean, cosine is going to have the same problem. It's not going to be 1 to 1 over its entire domain. So in order to define an inverse cosine function, we're going to have to restrict the domain down to a section where the cosine is 1 to 1. And this is, is the, seems to be the easiest area to do that. Okay, so we restrict the domain to just 0 less than or equal to x less than or equal to pi okay and then based on that on that restricted cosine function we can define an inverse okay and let's define that let's write that out okay the inverse cosine function the inverse cosine function again denoted by cos inverse x is the inverse of the restricted cosine function y equals cos x Okay. Uh, uh, and specifically on 0 less than or equal to x less than or equal to pi okay so this is just exactly what we just described with the sine function except now we've shifted it over a little bit and we're talking about cosine and so what again what does this mean well when we say y equals the inverse cosine of x that means cosine of y equals x where you know y is between 0 and pi and x is between negative 1 and 1. It's a very similar definition to the sine function. It's just now we're talking about cosine and the, um, the, dom the restricted domain has changed from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 which is what we saw for sine and now except now it's 0 to pi okay the method that we are going to employ for identifying exact values of the inverse cosine function is exactly the same as with sine let's do an example 
let's find the exact value of, let's see, inverse cosine of negative square root of 3 over 2. Okay, so step one, let's be explicit with our notation. Some angle theta is equal to the inverse cosine of the square root of, negative square root of 3 over 2. Okay, and so that means, right, this thing here implies that the cosine of theta is equal to negative square root of 3 over 2. Okay, and <clears throat> we can look at the unit circle. Right, so when we look at the unit circle, and remember here we're interested in between 0 and pi, so just the cosine values up here. When we look at the unit circle, we are looking for a cosine value of negative square root of 3 over 2. And so we can see that's right over here, right? And so that's going to be 5 pi over 6. Okay. So looking at the unit circle, I'm just going to be real explicit about this. Looking at the unit circle between 0 and pi we see that when theta equals 5 pi over 6, then cosine of theta equals negative square root of 3 over 2. Okay, And so the answer, therefore, 5 pi over 6 is equal to the inverse cosine of negative square root of 3 over 2. And so that's our answer. Okay, very good. All right. So we've talked about the sine function, what it's, how it's set up. We've talked about the cosine function. We've done examples from each. Let's talk about the tangent function. Okay, let's talk about the tangent function. So for the inverse tangent function, if you remember what the tangent looks like, I'll draw it small up here because I need the space for something else here. But let's say this is our x and our y. Remember the tangent function has all of the these asymptotes. Right? It does something like this. Well, so obviously you're going to have the same problem where you're not going to have one to oneness, right? But uh, we can just use the same trick. We're going to restrict the tangent function to be like the sine between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So we're not interested in this part or this part. We're just interested in this this central uh, region here. All right. So for the inverse for the inverse tangent actually let me switch pages here. Let me switch pages here. For the inverse tangent, uh, we restrict the domain to you know negative pi over two less than or equal to x less than or equal to pi over two. Okay, this is uh, oh sorry you know what I have to be careful here because this is an open interval. Let me make sure I'm careful about that. So note. This is an open interval, right? Meaning, you know, if you think about it in interval notation, it would look like this. Negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Open, right? Meaning that the endpoints are not included in the interval. And specifically because tangent of pi over 2 is undefined, right? And tangent of negative pi over 2 is also undefined. So the inverse doesn't work there, right? So it's open interval. Right, you can think of it. Let's just draw the picture here. You know, if this is again the same picture that we just were kind of looking at. Here's our x. Here's our y's. Right, and we'll say over here I've got an asymptote. Right, and this is pi over two. And then let's see, what is that? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Over here I've got negative pi over two. So I've got another asymptote here. And we know that tangent kind of comes down, goes through the origin, and then goes like that, right? 
<clears throat> so if that's the tangent function, then we restrict it to just this domain. And notice these are asymptotes, right? Meaning that the function will never cross pi over two or be equal to, it'll never take on the value of pi over two, right? You can never plug pi over two into the function tangent, right? So that's why we need the open intervals here, okay? Okay, right? And with this kind of setup, we can similarly define the inverse tangent function. So the inverse tangent function uh, denoted by tan inverse of x uh, is the inverse is the inverse of the restricted tangent function. It's the inverse of the restricted tangent function, y equals tan of x. Uh, and the tangent is restricted, as we say, to negative pi over 2 is less than x, which is less than pi over 2. Right? Remember, open intervals. And so, like before, when we see y equals the inverse tangent of x, this means tangent of y equals x. Uh, where, you know, x is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. And what about x? Well, x can be any real number, really, right? It can be as negative as you like or as positive as you like. Okay. So the sine and the tangent have the same restricted domain. Cosine is kind of the weird one out. Okay, <clears throat> let's do an example. And again, it's going to follow the same basic procedure for identifying the values. Let's find the exact value of inverse tangent of the square root of 3. Okay, step one, theta is equal to the inverse tangent of square root of 3. Step two, that means tangent of theta equals the square root of three. <clears throat> okay, and so we need to look at a unit circle. And here again, we're specifically looking over here and we're looking for a place where the tangent is equal to the square root of three. Okay, and so this is a nice, um, <clears throat> this is a nice unit circle because it actually has the tangents listed here. And so here's your tangent equals square root of 3 up here. So at theta equals pi over 3. Okay. So step 3 then is to kind of pull it all together. When uh, theta equals pi over 3, <clears throat> tangent of theta equals square root of 3. So that means pi over 3 equals the inverse tangent of the square root of 3. Okay. All right, very good. All right, very good. <clears throat> and so those are, so I mean, so there's the, the three inverse trig functions. Uh, and we've talked about like the definition and how it's based on this restricted domain idea. We've also done examples of finding exact values for inverse trig functions. Right now, and admittedly, the examples we looked at were a little bit contrived, but um, we'll we'll get into some more challenging examples in a second. But we want to I want to kind of introduce another idea that goes along with these inverse trig functions that'll help with those latter examples. Okay, and so in, in algebra, in algebra, we've seen how, you know, f of f inverse of x is equal to just x. Uh, we've seen that. Also, similarly, we've seen how the inverse of f of x is equal to x, right? And so this idea of taking, of evaluating the inverse 
uh, evaluating the inverse inside the original function or conversely evaluating the value of the function inside the inverse and how it re how it results in kind of giving you back the argument uh, that idea uh, is extremely valuable uh, in the in the domain of the trig functions we, in fact we'll we'll use it a lot we'll just kind of try to undo the inverse functions sometimes and we'll try to undo uh, the uh, regular functions sometimes depending on our application and our need but this this extends also over into the uh, trig functions so this is true also for the inverse trig functions okay so let's write these out the inverse properties okay so we say that the sine of the inverse sine of X is equal to X uh, and this is true whenever X is in the interval negative one to one. Okay, so x has to be between negative one and one for the inverse to exist, right? So that's a prerequisite, right? If x is 500, then this isn't going to work out. Okay, and similarly, uh, the inverse sine of sine of x is equal to x uh, for x in the interval negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 right and so this is important right because sometimes you'll get values of x that are outside of this range it's really common here in particular right if I ask you for um, the sine of you know maybe pi then this is this this property will not hold if x is equal to pi right but if x is in the restricted domain of where the inverse function is defined then this works, right? So the inverse sine of sine of x is equal to x, but only if x is in this restricted domain area. Okay, and this same pattern will apply to the cosine and the tangent as well. Okay, so the cosine of the inverse cosine of x is equal to x whenever, you know, x is in negative one to one. Okay, and you can do it the other way the inverse cosine of cosine of x is equal to x for x in what? All right, well, sine was restricted here, so cosine is restricted slightly differently. Remember, it's 0 to pi. Okay. <clears throat> All right. And then the tangent looks a lot like the sine. Well, not exactly the same, I guess. The tangent of the inverse tangent of x is equal to x and this is true for all x for any real number x right any number between negative infinity and positive infinity this one works for and this other one the inverse tangent of the tangent of x is equal to x for x in it's like this interval here except open Okay. Very good. Okay, let's see a quick example here. The inverse sine of sine of pi over 4 is equal to pi over 4. Because why? Well, if I look up here, oh, sorry, I should have that on there. I'm so sorry. The inverse sine of the sine of pi over 4 is equal to pi over 4 because now looking back up here this is the pattern right pi over 4 is between pi over 2 and negative pi over 2 it's in that first and fourth quadrant right this side of the unit circle All right pi over 4 is like right here okay so that identity works there here's an example where we have a problem let's say what if I say the inverse sine of sine of 5 pi over 4? Well, it's not equal to 5 pi over 4. And why is it not equal to 5 pi over 4? 
5 pi over 4 is not between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. It's over here somewhere, isn't it? Okay, it's actually like down in this section. Right, so it's not in the appropriate side of the unit circle. It's not within the restricted domain. So basically, sine of 5 pi over 4 is going to give you a value that for which the inverse sine is not defined. Okay. So specifically, we would say this is because x equals 5 pi over 4 is not in the range negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So that being the case, this inverse property does not exist. That doesn't mean you can't figure out what that value is. It just means you can't use the inverse property. All right, let's talk about this. Let's talk this one through in a little more detail. Let's see how we might figure out what this one is. Okay, so, so we'll say we're going to find the exact, exact value. of the inverse sine of sine of 5 pi over 4. Okay, well we know we can't use, as we just saw, we know we can't use the inverse property. Cannot use the inverse property because 5 pi over 4 is not in negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, right? It's not in that range. Okay. Instead, we have to first figure out what the sine of 5 pi over 4 is. So first identify sine of 5 pi over 4. Well, we can do that, right? We can just look at the unit circle for this. Right, we can look at the unit circle, and we know that 5 pi over 4 is down here, and the sine is negative square root of 2 over 2. Okay, right, so we know that the sine is negative square root of 2 over 2. Okay, so we can say, I'm going to write this on here by looking at the unit circle. we see that the sine of 5 pi over 4 equals negative square root of 2 over 2. Okay, so then what? Well, let's remember what we're trying to do here. We got the inverse sine of the sine of 5 pi over 4. We know now that this piece in the middle is just this guy, so we're really looking at the inverse sine of negative square root of 2 over 2. Okay, and so this is just a straightforward problem like what we saw at the onset. So we say we start by saying theta is equal to the inverse sine of negative square root of 2 over 2. That means this is step 1, this is step 2, sine of theta is negative square root of 2 over 2. Right? And we can just look at the unit circle and see where, what theta will give us negative square root of 2 over 2. So we look over here. And for sine, we're interested in this section here. Negative square root of 2 over 2 is right down here. And so you could say, well, so 7 pi over 4 is the angle that's given on the unit circle. But that's an angle outside of our range, right? So instead, what we want to do is we want to think about this as negative pi over 4, right? Because remember, this, the inverse sine only works between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Right, so it's 7 pi over 4 is not in the range, but negative pi over 4 is, right, and they're, and they're equivalent, they're coterminal, aren't they? Negative pi over 4 and 7 pi over 4 are coterminal angles, and so we can just interchange them, right? And so what we want to use is we want to say, therefore, that uh, negative pi over 4 is the theta we're looking for. And so we can kind of summarize this. We can summarize this and say the inverse sine of the sine of 5 pi over 4 is actually equal to negative pi over 4. Right, so you see that definitely does not 
match the inverse property, right? It's a different angle altogether. Okay, very good, very good. All right, let's do a few more examples. Similar to this one, I like this one. Let's try uh, identify the exact value of cosine of inverse cosine of 0 0.6. Okay, and so notice, right, this is very important. You want to use the inverse property if you can here. Notice that 0 0.6 is between negative 1 and 1. Right, and that's the requirement. And so what does that mean? Well, that means that the cosine of the inverse cosine of 0 0.6 is just 0 0.6. Okay, because this guy here, 0 0.6 is in the range where uh, the um, inverse is defined. Okay. It's kind of an easy example. It's when it works. Let's do another one. Um, let's identify the exact value of inverse sine of sine of 3 pi over 2. Okay, so this one we're not going to be able to use the inverse property. Note uh, 3 pi over 2 is not in the negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 range. Interval, sorry, call it range interval. Right, so we cannot simply apply the identity. Right, so let me write that. So that means inverse sine of sine of 3 pi over 2 is not equal to just 3 pi over 2, right? So it's, we don't get to use the lucky, easy approach here. So instead, we got to think this through, right? We got to think this through. So we've got sine, inverse sine of sine of 3 pi over 2. Well, what is the sine of 3 pi over 2? Right? Where is 3 pi over 2? Well, let's just look on the unit circle. It's going to draw a picture, but we can just look, right? 3 pi over 2 is down here, and the sine is negative 1. So we can just use that information. So that means the invert. We're looking for the inverse sine of negative one. Okay. So this is the thing we got to figure out. So step one is to say theta is equal to the inverse sine of negative one, and step two is to say that the sine of theta therefore is equal to negative one. And now I just need some value in. Um, I need some value between negative pi over 2 and pi, pi over 2 where sine of theta is negative 1. And so we can look at the unit circle and we can see that down here sine is negative 1 and we don't want to use 3 pi over 2 as the angle but instead we'll use negative pi over 2. So here's positive pi over 2 up here, here's negative pi over 2. And so negative pi over 2 is what we want. Okay. So step three then is to kind of lay it all out. The inverse sine of sine of three pi over two is equal to negative pi over two. All right, very good. So hopefully these are, hopefully you're following along. These aren't too challenging, hopefully. Maybe a little bit, got just a fair amount to, you know, a little bit of bookkeeping, right? A little bit. Of, things to keep track of. Let's try another example, something that goes a little bit differently. Let's look for the exact value the exact value of the cosine of the inverse cosine of 1.5. Okay. So note 1.5 is not in the range -1 1 to 1. Okay, so we can't simply apply the identity. Okay, so we just need to go through and figure out what these values are. So let's start with this inside piece. Start with that one. 
So we'll say theta equals the inverse cosine of 1.5, and that means that the cosine of theta, this is like step one, this is step two, cosine of theta is equal to 1.5. So what value of theta produces a cosine of 1.5? Well, there are none, are there? Right? You don't have to, if that struck you as strange upon seeing it, you, yeah, you're right, like it is strange, right? So the cosine goes from negative one up to positive one. There is no 1.5, it never gets outside of that range. And so this is an impossible value of cosine. So this is an impossible value of cosine. And so that means this guy here is undefined or does not exist. So cosine of inverse cosine of 1.5 does not exist. Can't, uh, can't calculate something if it doesn't exist. All right, very good, very good, very good. Let's do a few more examples. Okay, a few more examples. Let's kind of mix it up a little bit with these. Uh, let's identify the exact value of the cosine of the inverse tangent of 5 twelfths. Right, so cosine and tangent, they don't, they don't align, so don't worry about trying to apply the inverse property to this. You're just gonna have to figure it out you know, using your intuition. So we'll start with the inside here, and we'll say that uh, theta equals inverse tangent of five over 12, and so that's kind of like your step one, and your step two is to say that the tangent of theta is five twelfths. Okay, and we can look at the unit circle uh, to see if we can find a value for this. For, so we're looking for 5 twelfths and specifically over here for the tangent. And there's nothing on the unit circle. So you got square root of 3, you got a 1, square root of 3 over 3, negative square root of 3 over 3, negative 1, and uh, negative square root of 3. Right, so there's no tangent value over here that's going to fit the bill. Right, so we're going to come up short. Right, so I'm going to I'm going to write here as a step 3 we can look at the unit circle, but we won't find 5 twelfths on it. Okay, just so you can use it as a reference, always as a starting point, um, but you you may not find it. Okay. So instead of using a unit circle, what we're going to do is we're going to pull out some of our right triangle trigonometry. So let's use right triangle trigonometry, trigonometry instead. Okay, so I'm just gonna like draw a right triangle here, right? And it's gonna look like this. I've got a theta here, and then I'm gonna put a five over here and a 12 over here. Okay, why am I doing that? Well, we know that the tangent is equal to the opposite over the adjacent, right? So remember, tangent of theta is equal to opposite over adjacent, which is five over 12 in this case, five over 12, right? So I've kind of written that in there. Um, we can figure out what this hypotenuse is here, right? Uh, so we can figure out what the hypotenuse is using the uh, r equals square root of x squared plus y squared. Let me write that in here. We'll call this r. We can find r by using r equals x squared plus y squared over, or sorry, square root of that. Okay, and so we can figure out what that is. That's going to be uh, 12 squared plus 5 squared. So this is the x component, that's the y component. So it'd be 12 squared plus 5 squared. Okay. And so this would be uh, all together, you've got a 144 plus 25, and so it's 169. Okay, and the square root of 13 there. Or sorry, the square root of that is 13. Okay, so that means r in this case is equal to 13.
Okay. And so here's a triangle that perfectly expresses what we're after. Okay. So tangent of theta is equal to 5 twelfths. Okay. So let's see what happens here. Watch this. So we say cosine of the inverse tangent of 5 twelfths is equal to cosine of some theta, right? Right, that this is the theta, and we've written it out here, right? This is gonna be some angle, right? T inverse tangent of 5 twelfths is gonna be an angle. That's the angle, we've just drawn it in this picture. We don't know what that angle is yet. Um, we don't need to know what the angle is, in fact. Uh, but we've drawn it in this picture and we have all three sides now, and so we can express the cosine of theta as the adjacent over the hypotenuse, right? In this case, the, the 12 over the 13. Okay. Okay, so we've, what we've basically done is we've said, hey, I need this piece here. I can't find it on the unit circle. Let me just draw a triangle that represents this, right? So, well, not this one specifically, but instead I've written this out tangent of theta equals 5 twelfths, right? And so I've created this triangle where I've created a theta and the tangent of which would be 5 over 12. I figured out what the hypotenuse is just using the Pythagorean theorem, Pythagorean identity, r equals x squared plus y squared square root. And so now I have cosine of some theta, right? And the theta is implicitly written in this right triangle. And so I can figure out what the cosine must be using the adjacent over the hypotenuse, 12 over 13. Okay, so that's a very clever way of going about this if you uh, can't find, if the angle is kind of an arbitrary angle. Right? You can always re-express the problem in terms of right triangle trigonometry. Let's do another example. Let's find the exact value of the cotangent of the inverse sine of negative one third. Okay. <clears throat> so we'll start with this inside piece again and we'll say theta equals the inverse sine of negative one-third, and that implies that the sine of theta is negative one-third, okay? Now, the sine of theta is negative, right, in this case, so theta must be between negative pi over two and zero, right? So looking at the unit circle, let's take a look and I'll show you what I mean by that. So the sine, remember, is the second value right and it's negative down here now obviously we don't see negative one-third on here right so that's a given right so but we do know that the sign of the sign is negative down here isn't it okay so um, basically we're, we're interested we're looking down in this section down below here so let me let me make sure I make a note of what I'm just, what I'm thinking here, so you guys can follow. Because sine of theta is negative, theta must be between negative pi over two and zero, right? In this case, right? And there's no obviously there's no such angle in the unit circle. Right, so we're gonna draw a triangle similar to what we did before. Okay, so we've got this lower quadrant here. And we're gonna make this angle here and we're gonna put our theta right there. Right, the sine is negative down in this area. <clears throat> okay, so remember sine of theta equals negative one third. And we'll say that's equal to our y over r, right? And so this is our y. And this would be our r, right? We know that the sine is the opposite over hypotenuse. Okay. 
And so what is the R in this case? What is the R? Well, we could figure out what R must be. R is going to be the square root of x squared plus y squared. Okay. And so we could also write that like r squared equals x squared plus y squared. Right? And so we know that the r needs to be 3, actually. Yeah, we have that part. So that we've got 3 squared equals, what we don't have is the x, I'm sorry, x squared plus, and then the y we know is the negative 1. Okay. And so what do we have here? We've got, well, we've got 9, basically, equals x squared plus 1. And so that means x squared equals 9 minus 1, so 8. Okay. And can we figure out what x is? Yeah, we just do a little algebra here. x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 8, which is plus or minus 2 square root of 2, right? Break this into 2 times 4. Square root of 4 is um, 2. Okay. So we know that x is equal to 2 square root of 2. Okay, so let's redraw this triangle here with all the pieces on it. So we've got our theta. We've got r equals 3. We've got y equals negative 1. And we've now got x equals 2 square root of 2. Okay, it's positive, right? Because of the quadrant we're in. Okay. So now we can just use, again, this triangle to figure out what the cotangent must be. So remember, the original problem says the cotangent of the inverse sine of negative 1 third Okay, and we know this is equal to the cotangent of whatever this theta happens to be, which is the theta we've drawn here inside this triangle. And so we can rewrite this as, what is the cotangent? It's x over y, right? So it's adjacent over opposite. I'll write that first, adjacent over opposite, which is x over y, which is 2 square root of 2 over negative 1. And so we get negative 2 square root of 2. Okay, so that's the, that's the answer to this problem. Very good. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, I think that's a good place to stop, I think. Yeah. So we've, uh, so, so that's kind of an introduction to trigonometric inverses all right so the we started with the sine inverse sine function okay we started with the inverse sine function we said we had this limit restricted domain oh sorry that's the cosine function where's my sine function well i can't find it we started with the um sine function And it was restricted to negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Okay. And on, on that restricted interval, we have the inverse sine function defined. Okay. And similarly, we did the same thing for the cosine. We restricted it to... 0 up to pi, okay, and the cosine function is defined on that interval. And then we did the, finally, we did the same thing for the tangent, and we restricted that to negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, and on that interval, we can define the inverse tangent. And so that's a good overview of the inverse trig function. So uh, my suggestion here is to do lots of examples of this type of problem, work through as many examples as you can find.
and um, you know don't shy away from the more difficult ones because that's where kind of the the more interesting things can uh, come up anybody can look at the unit circle cheat sheet and be like yes I found it that's what it is but it's more interesting when you have nested functions like some more similar to the to the latter examples that we went through in this section so all right so that'll be it for uh, this section and then I believe next time we get together uh, we'll talk about some applications of trig functions so uh, until then take care